Somebody once said to me, if you have the still, quiet voice and you just listen, there's no question out there that can't be answered. You just have to take the time to listen and pay attention. So a lot of it was right in front of me. Growing up, who do I look like? Who do I look like? Well, always look at the palm of your hands. No, all I had to do was actually look in the mirror. Because I looked like Ernestine. My goggles are gone. These are not my goggles. I'll be right back. My name is Frances Hanover. I live in Calendar, Ontario. My favorite subject for the artwork that I do is the female form and female portrait. I focus largely on African-American, African-Canadian, African, West African, anything African as my subject matter. People sometimes thought I was committing ethnic appropriation by doing this form of art without having ownership or technically the rights to do this type of work because my background wasn't known. I was adopted by a German couple. They had three other children already. The adoptive mother was a foster mom for many, many years. And so she decided enough is enough. The next one that comes in, we're just gonna keep this one. So along comes me and they went, well, <laughs> she's, she's not quite German looking, but she's here now. But I remember when I was eight and I was at the park with my adoptive mother I just looked at her and I said, why don't I look like anybody else in this family? And she said in her German accent, she says, well, Francis, because you adopted. I didn't have you as a baby. We got you from the hospital and then we raised you. That is adoption. And I went, huh, okay. And then I left the bench and took off into the playground. Didn't matter one iota to me. When I was 22, our adoptive mom passed away suddenly from a heart attack. You know, then it starts to twig. Okay, well, maybe I do want to find out. But then I don't, and then I do. And, you know, years go by, and it's on again, off again. And it was more about finding out your medical background. I had a son when I was 19, and at 17, he became quite ill. He had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. After he finished all his chemo and radiation, within a few months, he had a psychotic episode and was then diagnosed with schizophrenia. So it was just one thing after another, and, and that's where I, you know, you really want to know what's your medical history. The stories growing up were that they would never be able to find my records because I was maybe born in a rooming house or abandoned as a baby or we don't know. Like there's no way to, to trace your biological family. If you got pregnant as a young woman in Canada and you were not wed, what would happen is they'd send you sometimes to a home for unwed moms. And it was not a nice place to be. You were treated very badly when you were there. So this is the one that I'm working on about the Senate report and the forced adoptions. So it is, does have the full report on there about keeping everything a secret and not revealing the information to the, to the children so that they can't even get their medical records. And even if the dads wanted their names on any of the records, their names were expunged. 
Yeah, the things people do to control other people in the name of social morality. Yeah. This is gonna go. <laughs> no, this is right. This is right. This is here. That's right. And then I finally just took the step. There was a deal on with Ancestry DNA, and I looked at that vial, and I'm thinking, oh boy. And then what I didn't know what the kit also did is that it acts like a Facebook page. Anybody who is willing to have some basic information about themselves that is connected to you by DNA is also there so that you can connect with them if you want to. So there was a person on there, a fourth cousin named Moki. She was working with a woman named Angela Trammell who works for Kinfinder. So she goes, I want you to connect with Angela because maybe she can help you find some more information, which will help me find more information. So we had a three-way call and Angela walked us through the steps of how to really read the data that you get in Ancestry. And one of the tips that Angela had said to me, she said, if you're going to inquire, you don't come right out and say, I'm adopted and looking for my family because that scares everybody. You say, hi, it appears that we are related and would you care to share some information so that perhaps I can learn more about how we're related and let the conversation go from there. So this other lady in Southern Ontario did similar with me. It appears that we are related, we possibly first cousins. Would you care to share some information? I'm thinking, oh, she's got this down pat. And I said, first cousins, that's a pretty close clue. Angela came back and said, she's not your cousin, she's your sister. What? And at this point, I hadn't seen a picture of her or anything. So I FaceTimed her and we just looked at each other and our jaws dropped because we looked so much alike. She laughed and she sounded like me and I laughed and it was like being in a mirror. You get really taken aback by that when you meet somebody that is clearly your relative. So then I went down to Toronto and I met with Candace at a hotel. We walked in, we looked at each other, what do you want to eat? It was like we had never been separated. I got a message from another gentleman. Hey, it appears that we are first cousins. <laughs> Would you care to share some information? I went, uh oh, well, here we go. And I wrote back, we are not first cousins. You are my brother, I'm your sister. Well, he didn't waste any time. He right away FaceTimed. The phone just blew up. I found her, I found her, I found her. He just started telling me, you have cousins and you have brothers and you, you, have, you have another sister and you've got, this is your family and they're all in Buffalo and you, the, your grandparents are from Alabama and it just went on and on and I couldn't keep track. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what's going on. And then they coordinated a family reunion in Buffalo. So Candace and I went and our first initial meeting was very carefully planned. We were at a hotel and it would be one sibling at a time. One of the siblings that came in, Andrea, was quite emotional. And I said, Andrea, tell me the story of what happened, of, of why do you guys know, why did you guys know I existed? And she just, fell apart. She said, all my life I knew you were somewhere. Our mother came home with you one evening on a Friday night and she said to Andrea, meet your new baby sister. And Andrea, who was four years old, said, can I name her? And our biological mother said, yep, you can name her. So Andrea said, I'm going to name her Clarissa. Clarissa Michelle. She said, the next morning, you and our mother were gone. I guess what happened was the grandmother who had been looking after the four older siblings had said, no more babies. I can't look after any more babies for you. 
you have to go. So the next morning, Ernestine left with her boyfriend and me in tow and went back to Toronto and I guess brought me to the hospital or, and gave me up. So in the meantime, Andrea, back in Buffalo, she said, where's Clarissa? Where's my new baby sister? And instead of them telling the truth and saying, you know, it's difficult to explain, but we can't keep her, whatever, whatever the reason is, they chose to lie to her and gaslight her and say, what baby? There was no baby here. Your mother wasn't here. You were imagining it. It was a dream. And she says, no, no, I saw a baby. And everybody went along with it that I did not exist. But Andrea knew I existed. So I handed her my birth registration. And there it said Clarissa Michelle Robinson. And it had our birth mother's name on there, Ernestine Robinson. And I said, so now you have your proof. The whole thing is just so tragic. I mean, she's great now. I think it just makes a big difference knowing that you are not crazy. And one little piece of paper showed that. So then they gave us the tour around Buffalo where they grew up, where they went to high school. And then we stopped to see another sibling, Freddie. Freddie opens the door and he looked and he slammed the door shut in our face. And we went, what did we do? What did we do? Demetrius came up the stairs and opened the door and he said, come on in, come on in. Freddie's just gone into the kitchen to go and get some water and stuff. And so they were just talking about family life and what it was like growing up and, and they are loud. I used to get kind of teased when I was younger. Fran, simmer down, you're so loud, you're always so loud. I got nothing on the Robinson clan. Poor Candace is looking at me thinking, are you all right? Like, you look like you're gonna have a heart attack. And I said, I can't even come up for air in here. <laughs> I'm just gonna let them talk, I'm just listening. And Andrea was very emotional again, and they just said, yeah, we're, we're really sorry, Andrea. And Freddie just kept looking at Candace and I, because we both look like Ernestine. As they were talking, one of the things they said, you know, we're really sorry, you weren't able to ever meet your mother. Um, she died when she was 50 years old, in 1991. And I said, oh, how did she die? And they said, well, she died in her sleep. We found her in the morning. She, we could tell she got up for breakfast and then she went back to bed to have a little nap. And she never woke up again. She had a brain aneurysm. I said, okay. And they said, and your uh, uncle Malik, he had a stroke. And Freddie, he has a small aneurysm as well, but they're not gonna do anything with it, it's too small. So I went later to my doctor. I said, I got some medical information. It's cardiovascular. Uh, my mother died of a brain aneurysm. I look a lot like her. I built like her. I think I better get checked. So I went for a CAT scan and two weeks later, I got a phone call that, yeah, you have a brain aneurysm and uh, you need to get it taken care of because it's, it's substantial and uh, it's a non-survivable event if it goes. So everything was just kind of meant to be. And I was at the same age as her at the time. So, yeah. I saved my own life by, by just spitting in a tube, yeah. literally. I just ordered something off of Facebook and on a whim, whim spit in the tube and ended up getting brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just not an everyday event. Yeah. <laughs> Who am I? Who do I look like? Where am I from? What's my background? What's my ethnicity? But for some reason, when it came to doing art, it was always black culture. And I never let it go. Then when the day came that I connected with my biological family 
that's where it all came out. I think a big fear with the adoptive families is that when we find our biological family, they think we're just going to leave the people who did all the work and run off and be with our biological family, which is its not about that at all because to me, as much as I'm welcomed with open arms to the biological family, I grew up with this family. This is all I know. <laughs>